Hey everybody, my name is Adam Neely. I'm here answering all of your questions about bass and music in general in this question and answer time number 27. And before we get started, I wanted to say thank you to all my subscribers because YouTube just sent me this thing, which is a YouTube play button that they give you for getting 100,000 subscribers, which is a number so large the human mind cannot wrap its head around it. Let's get started. Tanner Smith writes, Hey Adam, how do you keep from boring yourself with playing the same songs countless times? I have a regular gig on Sunday nights and I dread it now because we always play the same standards all the time. I've tried changing it up a little bit, but I'm not quite sure how to make them more enjoyable. That's definitely something that a lot of us have to deal with. How do you keep something alive and interesting when you're playing it for the millionth time? It happens to all of us. Now, the first thing I would suggest is actually try and rotate out songs because there are thousands and thousands of songs out there that really get people moving on the dance floor or good for jazz or other things. You don't always have to play Brown Eyed Girl or Mustang Sally to get people really excited. Now, even if you are playing Brown Eyed Girl and Mustang Sally, there are a bunch of things that you can do to practice and to keep it interesting, at least for yourself. For example, you could try and sing along with the bass line that you're playing or harmonize with the bass line that you're playing while you're singing it. That's something that will at least keep your mind active intellectually while you're doing something that might be crushing your artistic soul. And through that, you can at least get a little bit more meaning out of what it is that you're playing. Other things that you could do is you could also probably count out loud, maybe. Again, not probably not into a microphone, but count out loud and count the subdivisions as you're playing to work on your internal rhythm. And try and really focus in on making what it is that you're doing mean something to yourself, even if it doesn't mean something you know, in the general scheme of things. Like, hey, brown-eyed girl is brown-eyed girl, but at least you're getting some practice out of it. Isaac Ashton writes, Hey Adam, have you ever had to deal with much self-doubt as a musician? I recently started learning how to play the guitar a few months ago and I love it, but sometimes I get this really dreadful feeling that I'm musically inept as far as creativity goes. Self-doubt, I think, is a really important thing. It's an important learning tool. If you aren't doubting what it is that you're doing, if you don't have some sort of degree of self-criticism, you're not gonna grow because it's you are your own best teacher. If you see something in your playing or in your musicianship that you don't like, that's probably something that you're going to target and try and get better at and try and improve upon. If you don't doubt yourself in some aspect with a healthy degree of self-doubt, uh, you're not gonna grow. Now, too much self-doubt can of course be very demoralizing. And I think a really good thing is to surround yourself with people who are similarly like-minded, who similarly have some self-doubt, but are also very driven to achieve. That sort of person can be somewhat hard to find, but having a strong peer support network can go a long way in overcoming that negative self-doubt. Brian Yep writes, I strongly disagree. My girlfriend is a lyric opera singer, doesn't know much about the tuning systems in music, but has a unique connection and sensibility with it. She always felt each key differently and associate them to a feeling or state of the mind and soul. All she has no for her whole life, as most of us, is equal tempered tuning in A equals 440. So in that which key is the saddest video, I didn't touch on the human voice, and that I think is a little bit of an oversight because the human voice is really fascinating. Like instruments, there might be different relationships between keys based upon the physical properties of that instrument. For example, in stringed instruments, there might be a, a sort of predisposition to A or D, which are open strings. But the human voice is interesting because it changes depending on the actual person. For example, one person might have a really nice low E flat, like a bass E flat, and that particular key will have a certain sort of timbral characteristic when that person sings it. Of course, because it's the human voice, there's a degree of emotional connection because it's a physically a part of you that maybe not necessarily will come from playing other instruments as innately as the human voice. So it adds another layer of complexity, but of course now we can't definitively say whether one key is sadder than another because it comes down to the individual person. Carlos Diaz writes, What do you think about Spectre Sound Studio's latest video, Music is Not a Meritocracy? Do you personally believe that the presentation of music and the appearance of a musician is more important than the actual work produced? Is it true that people listen to music with their eyes, not their ears? It's an interesting video. Basically, Glenn compares this video of a blind guitarist shredding with this really crazy over-the-neck shred style uh, with that only has about 50,000 views to a female guitarist, singer-songwriter, who's singing a song, no auto-tune, just a straight camera with a camera mic, and she's showing a little bit of cleavage 
but the video count has three million views. And I'm very appreciative of the fact that Glenn did not attack the female songwriter because, man, that's the sort of the common garbage that's thrown out in a lot of YouTube comment sections when this sort of thing comes up. Now, Glenn goes on with a fairly crude view on objectification of women and sexuality and music and blah, 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 and it's not necessarily what I would 100% believe or endorse, but his main thing is that the presentation of music is very, very important. And we have this view on music is that the music should just stand alone, man, but that's really not how music has worked throughout history or even across different cultures or styles of music. For example, in classical music now, there's all these double-blind studies which have been done which prove that whenever classical pianists perform at competitions, the visual aspect of how they perform pieces is always rated higher, whether or not it's intentional or not, than the actual performance of it. This is definitely not something to bemoan, it's just something to understand. The more time that you spend complaining about this aspect of the human condition, the less time you will spend trying to grapple with it. There's a term that I feel like accurately applies here, and people are a little bit too obsessed with the idea behind this term. The term is acousmatic music. Music divorced from its source. So you're trying to understand the music without picturing or understanding the physical source of where that music came from. The term comes from music concrète, which is a French avant-garde music style or tradition from the 50s and 60s, and their solution was to never watch a performance. It was always just to put loudspeakers on stages. It wasn't the most popular thing. Audiences weren't flocking to concert halls to see loudspeakers on the stages, and I think that speaks to something that's pretty innate in us. We kind of want to see what it is that we're hearing, because it gives context to whatever it is that we're hearing, and we can more innately understand it. So the visual nature of it is really intrinsic to how we experience music. And I don't think it's necessarily meritocracy or anything like that. I think it's just something to understand. I think that was kind of like the main point in the video. So yeah, I agree with a lot of the things that Glenn was saying. Raniel Perez writes, Hey Adam, what do you think is the main influence in people throughout time and ages that causes music to change style, such as Baroque? medieval, renaissance, etc. Do you think it is because of the popularity or people throughout time change perspective of things and it is shown by music? What do you think? That's a huge question and honestly something that nobody could really answer with any degree of precision unless it was some part of some doctoral thesis or whatever. I don't I don't even really know because music is a part of culture. And to understand how culture changes throughout the centuries would then help you understand how music changes throughout the centuries. So uh, different wars, different events, different immigration patterns, the advancement of technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But also you have to think about music as always being cumulative. You always have to understand every new movement in music based upon what came beforehand. And that translates back thousands and thousands of years. You couldn't have jazz in the 1100s for many, many, many different reasons, but it could definitely exist now because of all of the precedents. So I think that's kind of the lens through which you have to understand that question. Pussy Nutella writes, So I have a question. I'm in 11th grade, and I'm beginning to think about which music schools to go to. I've done some research and have concluded that degrees aren't really that important. I'm not so sure. It's just an opinion. Tell me if I'm wrong, though. So I was thinking, besides trying to be really good at my instrument, I should really go to lots of colleges and get lots of contacts. So I was kind of thinking of staying in Berkeley for a year, assuming I get in, then go to another school like Manhattan School of Music, assuming I get in for another year or so, then maybe go to another school like New School for another year, assuming I get in. This way I can learn a lot of things from many teachers and get lots of contacts with many people across the country. So I understand why you're asking this question, because I and many other people have suggested that networks are the most important thing when you go to music school, and that's definitely the case. But understanding what a network is, is important because it's not just meeting as many people as you possibly can, it's also developing relationships between people. Berkeley, when you go there, they will hammer in the same thing. They'll hammer in the network is the most important thing and that's great, but what a lot of people ended up doing is just meeting a bunch of people and never hanging out or actually spending any time with anybody, developing relationships, making friends. If you go to Berkeley and you spend one year there and then you transfer to another school and spend one year there, nobody's gonna remember you and the chance and likelihood that you've developed a meaningful relationship that will carry on into your career is quite limited. Beyond that, though, most music schools just don't accept transfer credits. They'll accept things uh, you know, as part of a bachelor's degree, like science or humanities credits. They'll do that, but they won't accept like theory credits. You can test into theory, and that that's fine. But at the bare minimum, they want you to be there at least for two years to take your money for two years. So. I don't see that plan happening or being worthwhile at all. I would strongly advise against it. I would strongly advise you stick to one school that you really like. Ethan
Ethan Emery writes, You've mentioned going to the Manhattan School of Music. I've been looking into it, but I was wondering if their bass program includes electric bass, or is it strictly double bass? Yes, you can play electric bass as part of the program at Manhattan School of Music, but it is a jazz school, and there is definitely some vibiness associated with electric bass. Everybody will be kind of pushing you towards upright bass. There might be some people looking down on you for playing electric. I certainly had that experience when I was there. Uh, and I had that experience for about a couple weeks when I had my five string electric and I was playing that. And as soon as I got my four string acoustic washburn, all of the vibiness ended because my four string acoustic washburn kind of looks like a jazz guitar. It looks more jazzy, but yes, just know that for a lot of programs outside of Berkeley, you will get some weird pushback uh, from the jazz element of it. Random guy 97 writes, Hey man, you've mentioned before that you have all your music digitally because it's easier to keep up with that, that. I was wondering what apps or programs you use since there are so many out there. Yeah, sure. I use Adobe Acrobat Reader for my iPad and as seen in a previous gig vlog, I have quite the, uh, the spider crack on it, but you can still see everything. And I really like Adobe Reader because you can see all of your stuff and you can tap on the side and it brings it up really quickly. And there we go. This is Life on the Side by Tiffany Smith. I also sometimes use Fourscore. That's another really good one. Uh, for iPad, I mean, it, it's so easy. That's the thing. It's so unbelievably easy and convenient to have all your music digitized and use one of these programs. So I strongly recommend it if you have a lot of music and you need to organize it all. And it's way more convenient than using a binder. And it's also backlit. So in case you're on a dark stage, you don't need any stand light. And that is very, very useful. Taco, taco, Taco Taco writes, If you were clearer about what you said in this video from the start of your channel and other vids about being fun clickbait simple beginners intros to basic ideas, I think less of your audience would act like Kruger Dunnings and distort your image. Honestly hated you until now, but have gained some respect from you from this vid, if worth anything at all. So for those of you who don't know what Dunning Kruger is, it's basically the study that was done which explains how certain individuals who don't know a lot about a certain subject will think that they know a lot and actual experts of that subject think that they don't know as much as they actually do. It's this weird inverse and balance. Now, what I found, at least since that study became super popular, is that in YouTube comment sections, people just shout Dunning-Kruger at things that they don't like. For example, this individual, Taco Taco Taco, Taco has been just typing Dunning Kruger on all of my videos. That doesn't mean that I think that I am the ultimate authority on any of the subjects that I talk about. They're just things that I find interesting and I want to communicate them in an interesting way. So yes, you could shout Dunning Kruger at me, but I found in my personal experience that study has just been a thing for people to just fling at things that they don't like, which is of course, you know, hey, the internet. So <clears throat> anyway. What could I really expect? Troy Teeter 2 writes, For some reasons, it sounded like the intro was saying, I don't need these bass lessons. Kind of funny. Is there a word for when you put words and you imagine the place of the actual words of the song? Are there compositional styles involving this? Love the vids. There is a term for that, actually. It's called a mondegreen. Uh, there's a Wikipedia article on that. Let me just double check. Is there a Wikipedia article on that? Yes, there is a Wikipedia article on that. I'm not sure if anybody has really exploited this phenomena at all, but maybe that's something that you can do. It's a, it's a fun little thing that happens sometimes. So there we go. David Nasserian writes, Can you elaborate on your comment about how gentrification is causing live music places to shut down? I hadn't realized that this was happening. If anything, I would think that gentrification is expanding the live music scene. Yeah, so the cycle of gentrification is this. A music venue might open up in a place where the rent is cheap and might encourage other music venues to open up there. The presence of those music venues, if they're well run, causes the land value to go up around them, bringing different restaurants, etc., and then that causes more development causes the development of like luxury condos or whatever. And because the rent has skyrocketed so much, now those music venues aren't profitable anymore and then they close. Thus the cycle of gentrification is complete. And that basically is the case all across New York City. And like a, maybe two years ago, essentially every, with the exception of maybe two of them, every music venue in Williamsburg, one of like the big hearts of like the Brooklyn DIY scene closed because they couldn't afford the rent anymore. Vice opened up a bunch of offices and closed out like maybe three or four of the huge big venues like 205 Kent and Glasslands, which are these crazy venues, which, you know, that's just the cycle. That's what happens. Gentrification kills music in a lot of ways. Oscar Akerlund writes, Hi Adam, I'm traveling to New York soon. I would like to know what your favorite music store I New York is. My favorite music store in New York City, uh, it's a small one. Um, it's 30th Street Guitars. 
Ironically, it's on 27th Street because they were priced out of 30th Street, but it's on 27th Street near the Fashion Institute. They're just really delightful people there. Uh, old school guitar store. There's all sorts of fun vintage guitars. 30th Street guitars. Check it out. Nick the Blues Man 1 writes, Hey Adam, someone recently said to me that I was not a musician because I taught music in school as opposed to actually gigging, and it sort of bothered me. If I didn't actually teach, then I wouldn't be able to support myself. I think the definition of a musician changes, and the roles that they play have changed. Thing is, though when I was at university studying music, most of my teachers really didn't gig. They were academics and teachers, but not for a second did I not think of them as musicians. Thoughts? That's a tricky one, man. I wouldn't say that you're not a musician, but I think that performing is very important for teaching. How do you teach somebody to perform if you yourself are not really a performer? It's a little less academic than teaching. You can't just think about theory of performance, you have to actually do it and understand it and experience it and relay that information. And you have to constantly be doing it because performance is something that's living and breathing. I think that it's important for you to perform and figure out ways for you to perform just for the benefit of your teaching. And I think the teachers that I connected with the most were the ones who were also performing the most and working the most because they understood what it is I was trying to do. Teaching, when it occurs in a vacuum, becomes very stifled, and I feel like it doesn't really breathe. You kind of don't get the essence of music and get the essence of what it is that you're trying to do. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. I'm not going to say that you're not a musician if you don't perform, but I think it's important to perform. Fortunate Losers writes, Hi, Adam. Thanks a ton for all the great info and inspiration your channel offers people. I have a question about the drummer in the wedding band's musical choices. He seems to play quite busy parts, but to me it seems to fit the mood and feel quite well. But I'm not concrete on my thoughts on that. Can you talk about a bit about your thoughts on a drummer's musical responsibilities at a wedding gig like this in your next q and I feel though my personal preference is a tad biased and could use your perspective. Yeah, that's Luke Markham, and I've heard that same comment about him many times, actually. What he's doing shouldn't work, but it does. He definitely comes from more of a jazz background, and he definitely plays busy, but I think the thing that makes it work is he kind of approaches playing wedding songs and playing pop songs like a big band drummer might play. Big band drummer will always be accentuating certain hits in the horns and be playing the drum set kind of as, as this full symphony rhythmic orchestra kind of thing. And he kind of does the same thing for simple pop songs because he knows how to accentuate certain parts of the melody. And I think that's really important because when he plays busy, it's with a purpose. Every single fill that he might play and every single thing that he might play is always with the purpose of accentuating the melody. And that's a really important thing, I think, whenever a drummer is learning how to play and you know accentuate certain things. Playing busy for the sake of playing busy you know, will kind of make everything go awry, but the singers always feel really comfortable with him because if they feel like he is actually playing along with them, and that's great. I think that's really important for any kind of drummer, um, not just in the wedding sort of situations, but how to understand the melody and be able to accompany singers that way. And uh, yeah, Luke is a beast. Manel Fogo writes, Adam, could you tell us about how learning piano and guitar influence slash change your manner of playing slash think bass? I'm assuming that bass was your first instrument. I'm asking that because I'm currently studying guitar and barely lay my hands on the bass. But when I gig, I'm a bass player, I'm noticing that I'm hearing much more. I don't even know how to explain it, but I also notice that my speed runs are less precise. So knowing many great bass players that play piano, I'm also thinking on tackle that keyboard too. What do you think? I won't say that learning piano and guitar has has explicitly changed the way that I've played bass, but rather it's kind of made it so that when I'm playing bass, I can understand in much more intimate detail what the piano player is doing and what the guitar player is doing. And I think that has given a lot more information to my bass playing. And so it gives me a sort of a general feeling of how to interact with the guitar player or the piano player. When you play all of these instruments, you know how they all interact a lot more so that when you're playing one instrument where another person is playing another instrument, you know very specifically how they're going to play and you can react accordingly. Arvid Olson writes, What is the best way to support you if one don't feel one have the funds to do said thing through Patreon? You can just keep watching my videos and share them on social media. That definitely helps a lot. So. Even if you can't afford to donate to my Patreon, share my videos. Peter Marsh writes, I would say John Cage's four minutes, 33 seconds isn't music. Tongue sticking out emoticon. So my question for you is, is have you ever listened to four minutes and 33 seconds? And I don't mean just like listened to nothing for four minutes and 33 seconds. I mean, actually been at a performance of four minutes and 33 seconds with an audience and a performer. Chances are no, because whenever you have done that, you kind of instantly get it. Uh, basically what happens is you have a performer on stage and we are, like we said earlier, we are preconditioned to sort of understand music based upon what we're seeing with our eyes. And we're anticipating there being music coming out from there conventionally. But at the same time, nothing happens there. 
and the performer, and instead we're slowly being made aware of all the tiny creaks and noises around us. And it's not necessarily that they're always going to be contextualized as music, but it's a visceral experience. It's something that's uh, kind of hard to really describe, especially when you have an open mind and you're not going into it thinking like, oh, this is bullshit, you just, and there's nothing going to happen. Go into it with an open mind. I guarantee you you're going to experience it a little bit differently. I'm not saying that it's the most important piece of music ever or whatever, uh, but people who dismiss 4 minutes and 33 seconds out hand have, I guarantee you, have never actually seen it. So... There we go. Mr. Cookie 31C writes, Do you think that there are boundaries of professionalism? Like, would you play at a political event if you got hired but don't agree with their standpoint? Do you think it is appropriate to choose principle over professionalism, or would you consider this unprofessional? Yeah, I'm sure at some point I might run into it. I haven't yet. I mean, I do think of the scene in Clerks where they're having a discussion about whether it was right for the contractors to work on the Death Star, you know, like whether or not it was morally right for them to take the gig, even if it was like uh, paid really well. I did have a teacher who was fairly leftist leaning and it was during Occupy Wall Street. So New York generally had a like kind of leftist feel in the air. And he was talking about like, you know, asking the question, was it like right for us to do gigs as musicians? Uh, you know, when you had very foul people, rich people who cared very little for us and the plight of the working class as the people who are employers and contractors. And, you know, it was a question. He didn't really answer one way or another. And, you know, he was definitely sympathetic to our plight because, you know, we need to work too. Uh, but he was definitely more of the academic side, the kind of teacher who doesn't necessarily gig that often. If I asked the professors, prof professors of mine like Dave Lehman maybe, of like whether or not to take a gig, you know, he'd say, yeah, rich people fucking suck. They're terrible human beings. They'll still take their money though. At the end of the day, you know, we have to, we have to work. And who's going to be an employer? Most of the time, rich people are the employers of musicians. Um, and rich people might not necessarily have politics, which we might agree with. I haven't been in a situation, nevertheless, like a political fundraiser or anything like that, where I found myself like so detested by my employer's politics, I would refuse to play. Uh, I don't see that happening that often either. Mark Jones writes, Hey, Adam. I'm a piano performance minor, but I also play guitar and bass. Bass for the win. And my professor said something interesting to me. He said that I lacked confidence when I played. When I asked him to elaborate on that, he wouldn't answer in a clear way and only say, play for yourself. So I do this with be a piece I'm performing for my exam, played it the best I've ever played it, and he laughed midway through the exam and said, is that really how you play it? So I was wondering if you could possibly tell me what confidence on an instrument is if not playing to what you find the music is the best performed in or played to the best of your ability. Well, that's certainly not abusive, laughing at your student when they're doing their best. Uh, yeah, first of all, I understand what he's talking about because confidence is, of course, very important. Uh, I probably would definitely not teach it that way, though. Uh, the thing that I like to think about whenever I'm thinking about the idea of confidence in playing, and confidence is important, is the idea of physicality. When And I learned this from watching a piano player, actually, not a bass player. Uh, sitting next to a piano player who really was quite an amazing jazz pianist, I noticed that there was a big physical presence in what he was doing, and it wasn't necessarily that he was playing with a lot of force, although he was, it was just that he was, his entire body was committed to what he was playing. It was not just his fingers or fingertips. His entire body seemed to be into the instrument and attacking it. And there was basically a feeling of like total commitment to it physically, on a physical, visceral level, not just some sort of intellectual level in your head and whatever, just all of the body was involved in performing the sound. And that's what I like to think about because confidence kind of comes from the ability you can feel like you can throw your whole body into it and still perform it with good time, good uh, technique, good time feel. It, like everything would still feel really nice and strong and centered while your entire body is into it. I think that's what confidence is, at least in playing music. Um, so think about that. Also think about maybe getting a different professor. And that's it. That's the end of the Q&A portion of question and answer time number 27. But before we go, I just wanted to mention these Meze headphones. These are really nice, stylish headphones that they sent for me. Uh, they are very nice. They're very stylish. They look like that. Um, I've been using these Sennheiser HD 280s for forever, uh, and they're nice, but they really hurt your head after a while. I have a big head, in case you haven't noticed, and these are a lot more comfortable, so I'll definitely be using these in the future. Anyway, if you enjoy what I do, please comment, like, and subscribe. Consider joining my Patreon also. It's because through these people below, um, I am able to do this. I'm so immensely grateful to these people below 
for letting me do this week after week after week. And it's really, I thank you so much. Um, if you have subscribed, please consider clicking the ringy button below, like next to the subscribe button, just so that you're notified for whenever I upload new things. Uh, it's generally going to be on Mondays, like today, but at the same time, sometimes I release other things throughout the week and you don't want to miss, miss that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I have some really exciting things coming up in March. Uh, I have some more awesome videos. I have some more Adam Neely's bass lessons planned. So if you're a bass player and you've been hurting for bass lessons, I actually have some bass lessons with bass specific content planned. That's going to be fun. That's going to be exciting. That's probably why you first subscribed in the first place if you were a bass player. So yes, bass lessons are definitely coming. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, and it's going to make more sense when you have the bass lessons, but yeah, let's try it. Try it now. Here we go. Until next time. Peace.